All right. Well, welcome everyone to our third installment of Money Talks. Um, I'm personally very excited to do these. Um, I'm very excited to be part of Collab Capital, but um, even more so it's personal passion to help demystify some of these things for entrepreneurs, absolutely, but anyone um, specifically. And so thank you for spending some time, 5 p.m. on the East Coast to talk through financial projections, which I know are the most riveting topics in the world, but well, we're gonna have some fun with it today. So let's talk numbers. So today we're going to talk about building out your financial projections. Um, and we're going to both go through at a high level what projections really do and mean, and then also hop into both an example model that we've been using the first two weeks. But also, if we have a chance, I'm going to try to build a very simple model from scratch so that people can understand at a high level how simple it can be. So today's objectives, there are three objectives. And what I've done is I've kept the middle objective consistent throughout, and that's been on purpose. I think the biggest issue I see um, is just removing the stigma of finance away from entrepreneurs generally, but particularly black entrepreneurs. I believe too many founders in general struggle with finance. It hinders their business. Um, I don't think some of this stuff is all that complicated. A lot of it is pattern recognition. And also in the context of Collab Capital, part of what improves your chances of getting financing is just a basic understanding of finance. So as a quick background, um, as you can see I had the Morehouse sweatshirt on today. I am a Morehouse alum, Harvard Business School alum. And I've spent the past 10 years in a small and medium business finance. Um, and due diligence. And so on top of removing the stigma, the second sort of objective today is don't stress. Nobody is good at predicting the future. So projections are one of those things that I think even when I saw it for the first time, I looked like a deer in headlights. And even as I started doing it after business school, it still gave me a lot of anxiety. Well, what if I do this wrong? Or what if I do that wrong? Or what if I do the other thing wrong? And now what I tell anybody who works with me or anybody I'm working with is, it's the future. Relax. Nobody's actually all that good at predicting it. Um, I have two of my friends, Jeff Harold and Michael Lucas on the line tonight, and they do this professionally. And if you got, you know, 20 minutes with them, um, they would tell you that this is predicting the future, do the best you can. Um, some models are probably way better than others. I'm not gonna misguide you around that, but they're all predictions of the future, which we're pretty bad at generally as humans. And really what you're using the projections to do are to evaluate different alternatives. So it's not about getting the model right. There's no real right. It's, does your model effectively help you make good business decisions? Um, does it not help you make decisions or is it set up such that as you get more data through your experimentation process, does it continue to help you even though it's imperfect? And then the third objective, projections are needed to get burn rate, runway, and your fundraise amount. And so because that's so mission critical in startups, you really need to know your burn rate, which is how much money you spend on a given month, your runway, which is given how much money you have, how many months can you survive at your current burn rate? And as a result of those things, fundraise them out. So when you're looking to raise capital, how much do you need to get to the next milestone? These are business fundamentals, particularly for entrepreneurs, because it talks about how long you can stay in business. And you don't want to go into critical discussions and be blind. Today's agenda, I'm going to quickly go through a recap of week one and two. And then the agenda for today, a few simple points. So why are financial projections important? Simple financial projection format, um, financial projections, best practices. The great question sort of, when are you done? You know, does this exercise go on forever? Is it um, phased? How do you think about that? And then let's be completely honest. For a lot of people that are here, 
you are technologists, you are business operators, you are amazing in your field of human endeavor, and financial projections may not be it. So in that case, where can you get help? Um, I've talked to all the partners at Collab Capital and hundreds of investors over the time. And um, if you don't know this stuff, just get help. Um, the help is probably worth the cost of attendance. So the first week we went through Finance 101. So how founders use finance, the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, runway and burn rate. And then we did all of this really to highlight the point that all of these things are used to help you make business decisions. So you do work to help you make decisions. That's the whole purpose. So you can't forget that all these things are used to help entrepreneurs make decisions. Then week two, we talk through cash flow for founders. So what is the difference between profit and cash flow? Why do I always hear about profit and not cash flow? Why is cash flow so important? How can I calculate it easily? And then how can I practice more? So if you are interested in those topics and miss those sessions, the recaps to those sessions are available on our social media, both um, Instagram and LinkedIn. And if you have any issues finding those, you can email any of us and we'll send you those sessions. We take them. So today, why are financial projections so important? So before I get into this topic slide, I'm gonna hop in here and see if we did roll call. So T.L. Williams, yes, we do have recordings for week one and two. Um, thank you for the love on the hoodie. Rachel Wilson, money. Yes, we can get recordings. Okay, great. QA. Okay, I'll get into total adjustable market a little bit further into the presentation, Tamisha. Don't let me forget. So, why are financial projections important? So, at a high level, here's why anybody does this. You want to understand your burn rate and therefore your runway, which is how long you can stay in business at your current spend level and not go out of business because once you run out of money there's no more business also and i'm using fancy language here but there's really no other way to say this evaluating strategic business choices so do i hire a developer and a salesperson that cost me twenty thousand dollars a month or do i spend the next two months working on an email uh drip campaign because my money is short and i need the revenue in the door to um increase my cash and increase my runway the models help you make those choices with some data um, creating a hiring plan so in almost all of the financial models that we look at here at collab there's some context of six months in we're going to hire another developer four months in we're going to open up another city and so when you think about creating those plans you can talk about them in sequential order but it's way better when you can say, okay, between weeks, between month five and seven, I will create enough cash to move into Dallas or Charlotte. And then for understanding how much cash you need to raise in your next round. So the rule of thumb is think about when you can get to your next milestone, multiply that times 1.5, and that's probably about how much money you need to raise. Well, if you don't have a good context of your burn rate and your runway, you won't even know how to do that math. So simple financial projection format. So you probably all seen 20 tab financial projections. You probably also seen single tab financial projections and you probably had an opinion about both. After looking at hundreds of these, what I'll tell you is that the good ones have this format. They have an assumptions tab, which lays out the top assumptions that are gonna drive the model. They have an income statement that has revenues and costs. And because this is catered towards startup models, they have some context of burn rate and runway. Um, even in your friends and family round, you want to have some context of this $50,000 that I'm going to raise from five different people is going to get me to where. And just having an idea of what the answer to that is will be very helpful. 
and we'll get into examples in three or four more slides. So this is meant to be um, way more sort of uh, interactive and practice oriented than just me speaking to you. So let me get through this piece. And I'll show you what I mean by this, but what are some of the best practices? So you want to write your assumptions one time and never again. That's why the assumption tab is so important. You do not want to hard code assumptions into a cell and I'll show you why. You know, if you want to assume that, you know, 20% of revenue is going to be spent on HR, that's fine. But once you start hard coding it into cells, it becomes way harder to manage. The purpose of a model and a projection is to help you make decisions. So you really want to think about what specific things you're looking to model out before you start spending a lot of time on a financial model, because you can do a lot of work put a lot of numbers in and still not get to the answers to your questions. And that would be just a travesty. Um, and then four, this is a bit of my personal opinion, but again, it comes to the context of we are predicting the future. Nobody's good at it. So since your financial projections will absolutely be wrong, why not share it with people and get feedback? One of the best ways to speed up the process to get to a useful financial model is to share it with either other entrepreneurs, with other financially inclined people, just folks that can take a look at it. And since it's going to be wrong no matter what, you shouldn't think of it like a spelling bee where you misspelled their or your. Just share it with people who can help you. Also, for those who may have joined after we started, um, I only have two or three more slides and I'm going to hop into a sample financial model. And if you have time, I'm going to try to build one from scratch. If you have any questions about financial projections or if there's something specific you want to get out of this session, please pop it into the chat or the Q&A and I will try to answer questions um, in real time. And I'm going to answer this total addressable market question in a second. So when are your projections done? And I dropped the hint, sort of think your key variables or the key things that you need to know for the model to make sense, which was um, the specific things you want to model out. So um, you're sort of done when the items you wanted to know are shown. So if there's three things you want to know, burn rate, runway, fundraise amount. So when you get to those three numbers, at least phase one of the work is done. Um, when the key numbers make sense. So projections are typically an iterative process. You put the data in that you do know, you try to model out, say, an income statement or a profit and loss statement. And then you look at it and you say, wait, am I going to get to 24 million in my first year? Probably not. So in terms of like making sure the key numbers make sense, if something just doesn't fit after you do the work, then you're able to come back and sort of do phase two and clean things up. Um, I, I screwed number three up, but you're done when there are more knowns than unknowns. I wrote that incorrectly. Um, or no, sorry. When there are more unknowns than knowns, that's not a bad outcome. That's what I meant there. And so for people who are starting off, you're going to do some work you're going to get to something and it's going to be either, yeah, 24 million in the first year, or you're going to have more questions than when you started. That's not a bad thing. Um, when you're doing a startup, part of the challenge and part of the great thing about it is you're supposed to continually do experiments to learn what is your customer acquisition cost? What is the, the lifetime value of a customer? What is your cost of goods sold today? What will your cost of goods sold be in six months when you're in steady state? And so when you pop into a model and there's more unknowns than knowns, don't think of it as a waste of time. Think of it as now I have actually helped myself define what experiments I need to run to get certain data points that will help me fuel my projection. And once again, we're going to talk about some easy ways to get started. Um, because not everybody who starts a business needs to be a financial projection guru. 
some of these lessons are meant to show you how the business side of startups can help you do certain things. And if those aren't things you can do yourself, it's really just a nudge to understand enough to know you should go get help. And so where to get help? Um, your accountant can get you started. So we think of accounts office times as those people who count beans or do taxes, right? But they are financially inclined people that a lot of startup founders are gonna use because taxes at the beginning can be a bit wonky. Your account can get you started with the financial model, right? Some of you also have, or I know at least some of the companies in the collab portfolio have CPAs who are investors. Those are people who can help you get started with your financial model as well. So Upwork and the, the tens of thousands of other places where you can find um, sort of part-time gig economy work. If you don't know how to do this at all, the other thing you can do is find a fractional CFO or someone that specializes in financial projections on Upwork or any of the Upwork competitors. And then the other thing you can do if this is not for you is check out softwares or services like Xero, um, Bench, and other SaaS platforms that can get you started. And really what you want to do is if you're nowhere, use one of these tools to get started. And then once you get started, show some people so you can iterate. So this was meant to be a, a shorter presentation length because what I want to do is hop into an example model so you can see what it looks like. But also I am going to spend some time building one from scratch. So typically I would have had a 35 or 45 minute presentation. As you can see today, we're at 520. So we have 40 minutes to spend focusing on other things. So what is surprising is there's 23 people here and I don't see any questions. So without questions, I'm gonna go through what I think you want to know. But if you are here and you have some time, why don't you pop a question into the chat or the Q&A? That way I can be sure to answer the question that you have. I will start with um, Tamisha's question. So you're in the process of completing your pitch deck and need guidance on completing the total addressable market portion. Okay. So total addressable market is the value of all the customers that you can potentially service with your product or your service. So if I'm selling hamburgers, my total addressable market is any, any person of age to buy a hamburger. And if I'm thinking United States in all 50 states in the United States. So I want to do some research on what is the population of the United States I want to potentially say, I don't think anybody under 10 is gonna have hamburger money. And you might say people over 90 probably aren't buying hamburgers. And so I want people between 11 years old and 89. And you don't just want the people, but you wanna multiply the people times what is the price of a hamburger, right? And then how many hamburgers will the average person consume in a year? And so typically the total adjustable market is represented in an annual figure. So number of people who can buy your product, the price of your product, how many times people will buy your product in a year is the general way to get to total adjustable market. Now, in other things like software or um, even like SaaS services, there are some other sort of more particular ways to come to total adjustable market but they're very well written up on the internet. Um, if you have any questions about sort of a specific business that you're trying to get feedback on total addressable market, I will drop my email in the chat so you can email me directly. Okay, I saw a second question here from Gary, thank you. Any recs on best place to go to understand common inputs, assumptions, if we're in the beginning stages and haven't looked to engage accountants and CFOs yet? Absolutely, Gary. When I hop into the example model, I will show you some examples um, in a general sense. Um, 
what industry is your business in? And if so, then I can actually probably go into maybe more specific assumptions that may go into your business model. Chat, Tamisha, thank you. Um, I'm going up here. Amanda. Excellent. Amanda, send me the financial model to the email and I will take a look at it for you. Um, Tamisha, I'm in the restaurant delivery industry competing against DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, if that helps. Okay. Um, this is a great question. Um, and I hope people are listening. I also hope that out of the 24 people here, if anyone has a question, they, they pop it in. Um, it'll help before I get into the financial model. So the nice thing about the fact that you're competing with large startups and honestly pretty growing stage companies is you should be looking at um, paperwork that DoorDash has, um, has, has put out there, Grubhub has put out there, Uber has put up there around their total addressable market. So um, when companies file for going public, um, you can look at their whole prospectus for going public. When companies have, um, have they presented in certain places, you can get their total addressable market. There's also so many people who have invested in, consulted around, thought about um, sort of the um, conveniency delivery of food um, business. You should be able to spend some time online and get what did DoorDash say the total adjustable market is? What did Grubhub say it is? What did Uber Eats say it was? So the first place you should look for data like this is do research on your nearest competitor that's big. The big companies share a lot of data online that can be very helpful. If that data doesn't come through researching other companies, then you'd want to look at you should be able to find some percentage of the average United States American citizen that has ordered delivery food in the past 12 months. If these companies don't have it, public companies like Domino's, Pizza Hut, uh, other restaurants that are public, if you look at their annual reports or if you look at their investor presentations, which are on their website, you should be able to get some portion that says, 35 or 45% of the US population has ordered um, delivery in the past year. And then once you have that, that'll be sort of the core of your total adjustable market, because then you just have to understand the value of the number of people who order delivery and whether they order it through DoorDash, Grubhub, Call Pizza Hut or anyone else, because you can address the people who are ordering delivery that's part of your total addressable market. Um, Jewel, thank you. <laughs> S1s, yes. So, uh, Jewel, thank you so much for dropping this in. So if you want to get some real game on um, startups that have gone public, go to their S1s. There's more information in there than you ever want to read, but it's so beautiful to get it because most private companies, you can't get this information. Once they file to go public, you get all of this. Even if they file and don't go public, you still get all of this. So there was a big to do about when we work filed their S1 and all the craziness that they had to divulge in that. And so some of them are actually very, very, very entertaining. Um, so yeah, go spend your time doing that. And in general, one of the best places to get research on any business model is go find the biggest three companies in your industry and see what information they have put out into the market um, through S1s, through annual reports, through 10Ks, and through research on those industries. So for instance, top consulting companies like Bain, BCG, McKinsey, Accenture, if you go to their websites, they will oftentimes have industry specific research investments bank investment banks will as well those are all resources that you can use you can also leverage university research databases and tools or one of the benefits of hiring 
college age interns is that you can get access to their university information platforms to get data for your business. So those are all ways to get data to help with the assumptions and um, your model should look somewhat like the model for the bigger companies in your industry. Ashley Xanders, I'm so glad you looked up the one from Udemy. Um, it's a brilliant tool and it's funny, as simple as it is, you know, Google, it'll put you light years ahead of other people. Um, Rachel, thanks for posting the previous videos. For those who don't see it, you can see them here. The YouTube link is in the chat. Um, let me go to the Q&A. Gary and Tamisha. Think social networking app for a religious community. Gary, that does make sense. Um, for a social networking app, generally what you're going to be looking at is number of users, engagement level, and likely monetization. And so you're going to want to look at companies like Facebook, like Instagram, um, like other social networks to understand what are the key assumptions they have in their models. What are the key assumptions people are talking about as it relates to them? And those are the key metrics you're going to want to have in in your projection. So um, if we sort of connect what's stated here with what's going on in the chat, you should be looking at Facebook's S1. You should be looking at other social uh, networking apps, S1s. You should be looking at Generally, there's a, a long description of the business, right? And then there's a huge section on business risks. Um, if you look at the beginning of each section as a as a shortcut or a hack, you'll you'll get a lot of information on what's there. Um, and just keep going. Also, most of those documents are in PDF, and so Control plus F for find is your friend. So look for metrics, look for KPIs. Um, Control F for those things, and you'll find a lot of them in those S1 documents. So everyone, thank you for the questions. Please keep them coming. And I'm going to hop into an example model to show you how they're typically set up. And then if we have time and it makes sense, I'm going to try to build a quick one from scratch. But please keep putting your questions here. If I go into, I've been using this model a lot because I think it's great. It's Dollar Cave Club, not to be confused with Dollar Shave Club. But one of the big things I talked about in terms of financial model best practices and the key sections of a projection are going to be your assumptions tab. What is the assumptions tab? So. The assumptions tab are all the key metrics, drivers of business performance in your industry. So Gary, the assumptions in your business should go here, right? Um, it also is a great place for things that you don't know yet. And so they may change quite a bit as you continue to do experiments. And so you want to have them in a single page so that you can actually link the rest of your projection to these assumptions. So if these assumptions change, you can very easily change it in one place and it'll propagate through your model. So some of the things for Dollar Cave Club were monthly subscription price, their churn. So churn to be another um, data point for you, um, Gary. Page views per visit. So that's an engagement metric. So we talked about engagement metrics for you, Gary. Um, CPM growth per month on ad sold, max CPM. These are digital marketing um, metrics. Monthly search engine marketing spend, Google ads, monthly spend on Facebook, right? These are assumptions that drove their model. And I won't go through all the rest, but what you'll see here is if I kind of click through them, there's some more search engine marketing stats here around conversion rates, organic traffic, average cost per click, a bunch of assumptions. Now, gosh, Elliot, that's a lot. 
I don't know that much yet. Okay. So most models for startups, uh, this is probably enough to get started. What we do at Collab is oftentimes focus on the top five key metrics plus a North Star metric for all our companies. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Focus on five to seven things that really drive your business. You'll be light years ahead of everyone else. When you get to iteration two, three, four, then focus on the other 10 things that might drive your business. But don't, don't get confused. And if you don't know what these things are, heck, just start with two. So if you didn't know anything else, you could say the monthly subscription price is $29.99. I think my churn rate's gonna be five, 4%. Boom, let me build something off of that. I see a couple of questions, I'm gonna hop in. Tamisha, assumptions are your revenues and expenses. Yes, essentially. Um, but more specifically, If you think about, and this is why I get beat up as a, as a finance guy uh, by the operators at Collab, which I actually love the tension because I've been on both sides. So for a business operator, the metrics are things that actually happen in life. Like five people subscribed today, 10 people bought something, three people unsubscribed, five people told a friend who bought something. Those are physical things that happen in a business. As a financial person or an investor, what I'm looking at is how do those things translate into numbers and dollars? And those numbers and dollars always end up talking about revenues and costs. And that's what I'm looking at in a projection. That's also how I'm looking at how do I get my money back after I've invested it. So Tamisha, you're right on point. It's revenues and costs. For instance, I could go through each and every assumption here and tell you, is it related to revenue or cost? So subscription price, revenue, churn is essentially drop in revenue. These are gonna be ad sold, so revenue. This is gonna be cost. Search engine marketing, Google ads, I'm giving Google $10,000 a month. Monthly Facebook ad spend, $10,000, that's a cost. Search engine marketing subscription conversion, Facebook, subscriber conversion. Conversions drive actions, actions drive purchases, purchases drive revenue. These are revenue assumptions. And so you go through and that's that's how you think about it. So if you're stuck in terms of, well, gosh, what are my top five metrics, Elliot? How do I even get started? Um, doing artificial intelligence, uh, technology enabled, uh, softwares for outdoorsmen, whatever. Think about the one or two things that drive revenue the most, and think about the one or two things that drive cost. I'll tell you at the beginning of most startups, people is gonna be a huge cost. Um, so you're gonna have to sort of put assumptions around both sides. To drive the point home even more, I'm gonna hop into what they built out of this set of assumptions. So, out of this set of assumptions, what was built next was a monthly income statement. So if you look at this, the gray area, these are all actual. So these happen historically. But now these numbers like subscriptions, add-ons, e-commerce, they are a function of some of the things on the assumptions tab. So if I look at where they got the subscription revenue, that's coming from this tab, sales detail, subscription revenue. And if you look at how these numbers came about, they're all going to connect back to your assumptions tab that are driving these things. So when you think about your subscription revenues, that's gonna be a function of that $29.99 that was on the assumptions tab. Your direct cost, there's gonna be internet infrastructure costs. There's gonna be other costs that are sort of direct costs. There's gonna be other costs that are operating expenses that are gonna layer in further down here. And essentially when you get down to sort of your revenues, 
minus your direct cost minus your indirect cost you're going to get to EBITDA profit there's a bunch of ways to call this but this is kind of what you want to get to in your financial model now part of the reason why I wanted to show you an example model but probably here in a couple of minutes I'm going to hop into just a blank spreadsheet and just kind of build something from scratch is because although the models you see other places look complex. I know if I looked at something like this at the beginning, I would have gasped, shut my laptop, uh, called a friend, which isn't a bad thing. I told you getting help is really the right way to go for a lot of people. But you can build a simple version of this without much help, support, much of anything. So in lieu of other questions, I'm going to actually hop into a blank spreadsheet and start building um, a quick financial model and projection model from scratch to just let you know how simple it can be. Um, I'm still looking for, we have 19 minutes left, so please continue to ask your questions. Okay. If I want to build a model from scratch, the first thing I want to do is look at my assumptions. So I'm on an assumptions tab in a model. I've actually crafted three tabs. So an assumptions tab, an income statement tab, and a cash flow tab. And at the beginning, these are really kind of what you need. So let's say I am doing e-commerce just because it's kind of simple. So let's say this is e-commerce on a product online. So this is interactive. So um, if I'm thinking about building up revenue in an e-commerce business, so I'm selling products on, on Amazon, on my own website, um, what kind of things should I include in my revenue assumptions? Absolutely, sales for sure, refunds for sure. Cost of goods, man, that's a great one. I'm gonna separate these into revenue. Discounts, yes. Cost of goods. Okay. So if I'm thinking about e-commerce, so I sell a product for um, $10, let's just say. Um, let's say refunds are 3%. Discounts. Let's say I am getting started and so I'm offering a blanket discount of 10% for first time purchases. And I believe in the first year, all of my purchases will be first time purchases. So my effective price should have been price not sales. My effective price at a 10% discount should be $9. Now let's talk about what cost. If I'm doing an e-commerce business, I'm selling products on Amazon, for instance, what are some of the costs that I'm going to have? Yes, I'm going to have cost of goods sold, which is already stated. I'm going to have cost of, yep, cost of my site or platform. Shipping, great one, Tunisia. What are some other costs? Do I have packaging for sure? Where are my employees sitting? Do I have an office? Do I have rent? Here's another good one. Um, if I am selling products online, saw overhead, Rachel, thank you. I'll explain what overhead is in a second. Warehousing, to me, she looks great. You're ready to build a model. 
Uh, Tanisha, you probably got this under control. Um, unless my voice travels across the globe, I'm going to need to advertise uh, somehow for my product so people can find them. So there's going to be some advertising. Um, taxes. Yeah, you don't want to go to jail. Thank you, Rachel. Taxes. There's 22 folks here. So the only revenue I need to worry about price, refunds, discounts, effective price. Let's see. Those are decent revenue assumptions. Cost assumptions I have cost of goods sold, cost of the site platform, shipping, packaging, rent, salary, overhead, warehousing. Advertising, marketing, spend, taxes, inflation. That's excellent, um, Amanda. Tell you a little bit about inflation. I'll come back to you. Um, insurance. Legal. These are the great additions. Thank you for that. <laughs> Racial, oh, racial, yeah. Um, accounting for sure. So I think these are good to start. So again, um, I'm gonna hop into a couple of these that people should know about generally. And then I'm gonna try to focus our attention on a small set of metrics to drive the income statement because I don't want to overcomplicate this and I don't think it's that complicated to begin with. So revenue. So we just said price was $10 per unit. Refunds were 3% of sort of all sales. Discounts, if I'm offering a 10% blanket discount for first time buyers and I assume everyone in the first year our first time buyers and my effective price is nine bucks. Units sold. That's perfect, Gary. Um, and actually what I'm gonna do is put the units sold on a per month basis for the first 12 months. Put this down for a second and do some working. All right. So, cost of goods sold. Let's just say on a ten dollar priced unit, I can get the cost at four dollars per unit. Now, what is a decent cost for a website or a platform? Somebody, what do you what do you think a platform cost or a website cost? Ah, Amanda, great. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, you could spend some money up front to kind of get it going, or you could use like Squarespace or something and pay $29.99 a month. Let's just go with that. Although Tamisha, if you said 49 per month, that wouldn't be out of whack, right? So $29.99 a month. Shipping, let's just say shipping is an extra dollar on the cost of goods sold. Maybe it's two, maybe it's four. It's probably more expensive today because um, our whole supply chain is screwed up. Um, packaging. Let's say another dollar in packaging. Now, landing pages, by Shopify. That's a great question. I'm not going to answer that right now, Maurice, but you're on to the right path. Now, what I'm going to do is, again, to not... <laughs> yes, Tarisha, you can get it as cheap as you can. In fact, Part of the things you're going to want to do over time is reduce your cost. So let me sort of make this a bit quicker so we can get into how you build the income statement from this. Um, I'm going to add a line here. Let's just say at the beginning, there's no rent. Everybody's virtual, right? 
salaries. Let's say it's you and a co-founder. And although you want to make $10,000 a month, you know, you're not there yet. Um, you're going to just say 5,000 a month. So for two of you, that's 10,000 per month for two founders. Now in all reality, most times you won't take a salary to begin with, but let's just say that two people are taking $5,000 a month. That's where we are. So overhead, Rachel, you mentioned overhead. Overhead is generally defined as sort of all of the office and administrative staff that don't directly uh, work on creating the product or selling the product. It's kind of overhead. So like your middle managers, your um, ops manager that doesn't really touch the product or deliver it, all those things are overhead. So we're going to assume right now that this is um, side of salaries for now. Warehousing. Let's just assume for now that warehousing is included in cost. Or that you're drop shipping or something of that nature, so you're not paying warehousing. Now, advertising or marketing spend, we could spend a whole segment on this. Um, let's just say it's a dollar here. Taxes. Let's assume that for the first year we're going to Taxes are paid on um, taxable income, which is EBIT or EBITDA. And for the first year, you're probably not going to make any EBITDA. And so you can almost ignore taxes. Inflation. So inflation is the value of the dollar over time. It's absolutely something you should always keep in mind, but not something you really want to project in a financial model. And for simplicity, let's just assume these are zero. Now, insurance, you're probably going to wait a while to get that. I know a lot of small businesses that don't have insurance yet. Legal, if you are creating the, ent the uh, entity or you are talking to venture capitalists, you're going to have a legal expense. Let's assume you're still in the bootstrap round before much of friends and family. So let's assume that's zero and let's assume accounting is zero. So what I'm going to do is build the income statement from the information that we have here. Sales tax is a great one. I'm going to assume that my price is net of sales tax. And this is not just something I'm doing because I'm here. This is my email. Um, I'm not just making assumptions like this because I'm here and we're speaking. If it was my model, anything complicated, I'm going to try to make a simplifying assumption right away so that I don't have to worry about overly complicated things at the beginning. All right. Yeah, Maurice, got to keep going sometime. So now we're going to build an income statement, right? So we might not know much about income statements, but we know these sections. And you would know that even if you didn't know that, if you went back to our first session or watched the replay, you'd see the sections of an income statement. So you're going to have revenue, you're going to have cost of goods sold, you're going to have gross profit, operating expenses. And you're gonna have profit, which is gonna be bits. So units, so ten dollar units. Let's say the first one I can do five, I can do twenty. I can do 50 and let's say I'm fast growing and I'm doing 20% growth after that. No, let's not do it that way. So I'm going to say, let's just add 30 per month.
Okay, so then we start from five units per month, and at the end, we're doing two, 320 units per month just to start. So my revenue is going to be 10, but I took a discount on it. So my effective price, I hit the F4 key to lock it, times the number of units I sell in that month. And then I'm going to take that, I'm going to highlight all the way over to December, or I'm going to drag it over to the right. So just drag this over. And so for the year, equals the sum of all of these units that were sold. So given that I made $16,875 in revenue, given the assumptions that I had. Now, cost of goods sold, right? So cost of goods sold is gonna be per unit. So my cost of goods sold, I'm gonna add in shipping and packaging. So $4 per unit, shipping and packaging another two, that's $6 per unit. And then I'm gonna do the advertising piece separately. Cost of goods sold equals number of units times hogs plus the shipping plus the packaging. I'm going to go back here because these are assumptions in one tab. I'm going to hit F4. It's going to lock it. Hit F4 lock it hit f4 lock it see a couple of questions so i'm managing a shorter time period than i'd like i'm going to go over a couple of minutes so for those <laughs> Excel shortcuts. Yes, you should email me about those. I'm going to go over a couple of minutes to try to get to EBIT and then talk about it for a couple of minutes. So forgive me for going over, but I think at this point we should spend the time. So now I have my cost of goods sold $11,250. So my gross profit is simply my revenue minus my cost of goods sold revenue and it's cost of goods sold. You don't need them. So, okay. I'm just going to divide this into my revenue. So, right now, I make one third profit margin on each unit I sell, which is just revenue minus cost of goods sold. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that I have only one third of each unit price pay everything else if I want to have a profitable business. Okay. So operating expenses, we kind of simplified this. We set a platform fee. And we had advertising. marketing. So we have to take care of this and operating expenses. We have to take care of this, of this, and we assume these were zero. So the one I forgot was salary. Okay. The platform fee, that's not too bad. That equals $29.99 per month. I'm going to hit F4 again to lock that cell. I'm going to carry it over. Advertising and marketing. You said a dollar per unit. That's low. I'm just going to tell you that. Um, but for here, we're just going to say that is what it is. Okay. So for advertising and marketing, equals number of units times marketing advertising spend per unit, F4 again to lock it, 
I'm gonna carry that over. Salary. So it's ten thousand dollars per month for two founders. Okay. So in a very, very, very simple model, we now have revenue. We have cost of goods sold. We have gross profit. We have operating expenses. And now we can very quickly get to profit. Now, before we do the profit calculation, I talked about out of every unit I sell, only a third of it um, makes it past cost of goods sold. So as you can see right here, this business at the beginning doesn't look like it's making any money. So then profit is going to be your gross profit minus your operating expenses. That's negative. That's a lot of negative. So in your first year, unless I made any mistakes and I know somebody would have caught me if I made a mistake, you did in this model per the assumption, you did $16,875 in revenue, $11,250 in cost of goods sold, gross profit was $5,625. You paid just under $360 for your Squarespace website. You paid just over $1,800 for advertising and marketing. And you paid salaries of $120,000 to get two highly capable people to take a partial salary to build this thing. And so what you ended up doing is you lost $116,609. 616, and 90 some odd cents. So what did that actually help me do? Well, if this is my business, no, I'm going to ask. We still got 18 people here, which means we haven't lost many in the past five minutes. What does this help me do? I did all this work. I did a bunch of assumptions. I carried them out per units per month. I did a bunch of cost assumptions. Why did this guy waste his time doing this? What, what, what was the benefit of this exercise? There you go, Maurice. That's, that's definitely one of the reasons. Yes, Amanda, measure runway. We've been listening. Knowing your run rate, absolutely. How much money to raise, absolutely. Nail down target growth rate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Jay, great answer. Gary, I love it. Change your inputs, i.e. or e.g. Raise price, reduce cost, absolutely. Personal goals for your business, Rachel, absolutely. Holistically, this is why you do this. So let me just back up and quickly summarize what we did. We said, look, I don't know much, but I'm an e-commerce business. Price, refunds, discounts, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. We assumed all those were zero. So with 11 assumptions, right, just 11, we built an income statement for 12 months that showed us that after we did the math, we'll bring in just under $17,000 of revenue and we're gonna lose $117,000 
in profit and cash in the first year. So the reasons we would do this. And I hope I get everyone's, but it was fundraise. Um, it was change assumptions is what I'm going to call it, Gary. This was yours. Understand your growth rate. Uh, understand your run rate, run rate, run way. A lot of those terms are used interchangeably. This is why you do this. So if I was looking at this and saying, Elliot Holland is going to start an e-commerce business that I think can sell $10 per unit items with this type of cost structure. And I said, I was thinking about starting this January 1, 2022. And I know I'm going into Thanksgiving and Christmas to go see my auntie, my mom, my dad, my cousin that plays in the league all kinds of people and i'm thinking about what am i going to say at the dinner table for thanksgiving and christmas how much money do i need so if you were sitting in my seat how much money would you try to raise just to get through 12 months we're not going to go through you probably need to raise a lot more to get to a profitable state or get to a certain growth rate, but just, you're gonna lose just under $120,000 in your first year. But you think that if you prove these metrics out, you can show that you can make a profitable business over time. You're at Thanksgiving or Christmas, talking to your friends and family about how much money you need for them to invest in you so you have a chance to go become a unicorn. How much money would you, would you ask for? Um, a couple of answers I saw. So you'd make projections. Jay, you're absolutely right. If I had three more hours, I'd go through um, a more advanced projections. Here's the other thing about projections. Because we're predicting the future, you have to be careful about not projecting out too incredibly far, but you would absolutely make projections. Measure runway. Yes, runway is a function of burn rate and cash. So if you have zero dollars to start with, you got to get it. But she answered the question, 117000 That's one answer. So $117,000. $180,000. But hold on. How did one person come up with 117000 And Tamisha said one hundred eighty. This is just to get through your first year. 200 Maurice now we're talking Okay Tamisha you're absolutely right So what I said earlier was when you're thinking about raising money you typically want to raise at least 50% more than what you're going to need if I know I'm going to need $117,000 to get through the first year, the least amount of money I should be asking for is what Tamisha came up with, uh, $180,000, right? You might not get it, but that's what you should ask for. What if you made one simple mistake in these numbers somewhere? Or what if input prices go up 20% or you can't get $9 per unit, you can only get eight. You want to be prepared for all those things. Then Maurice said, hey, forget that. 230 i'm almost going to double the number look in this environment you're going to make a lot of mistakes give yourself as much runway as you can now if they're going to put you out of the thanksgiving table for saying two hundred thirty thousand dollars, then maybe you do 180 or 117 but go for a number higher than what you think you're going to need because once again once you run out of cash for most entrepreneurs you're out of business I'm going to go through these last questions and then I gave you guys my email for follow ups. There'll be a tape of this. Um, Amanda makes sense more. Yeah. Um, well, 
what I hope you got out of this was we spent about 20 minutes going through financial projection like theory, like why you do it, best practices, yada, yada, yada. We spent 30 minutes just saying, hey, in a random industry, I'm not an e-commerce expert, what are 11 assumptions? Because I don't know a whole lot. What are 11 assumptions that will govern this business? Given those 11 assumptions, what does an income statement look like? And once I got to an income statement, I'm going to lose $117,000 in the first year. I got to how much money should I raise? And I think it's about $180,000. Which means if you just ran this tape back and did just the top 11 metrics for your business and said, hey, I don't know much, but I'm going to do it just like that crazy guy Elliot did, you'll get something. And then, like I said on the slides, we're predicting the future. Everybody's wrong. Go show it to some people. Like a guy like me will look through your model. And although I might not be able to get you to an exact accurate model the way I would build it, I can tell you three or four things you can improve very quickly. And a lot of times that advice is free, but not for me, from one of your friends, from another entrepreneur, you got a lot of places to go. I'll tell you that we are gonna go through next week, something that makes, I think the first three sessions a lot more fun. Um, first session, Finance 101. Second session was cash flow. Third session today was projections. We're predicting the future. Start with 10 metrics, get something on paper, keep going. And then next week is you guys are business owners, entrepreneurs, startup specialists, not financial masterminds per se. So I will expound on quick hacks, easy places, strategies to go get this stuff done or get help to do this stuff. Um, either when you're starting the business and just kind of want to make sure you're grounded or before you go speak to a venture capitalist or any other time you might need it. Um, there are some ways to sort of speed this up, shortcut it, get you in the zone. So these first three sessions were to get you to understand why these things are important and give you some terminology to help you understand when people are talking about them. It's not some wild thing that you haven't seen before. And then in next week's installment, we're gonna talk through some shortcuts. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Thanks, Jewel, for popping my email in there again. Um, I will admit, uh, 19 folks stay with me in an hour on financial projections. Uh, I'm pretty excited about that. And um, hopefully you guys come back next week where we will go through tips, tricks, and hacks to get financials in order quickly, which I think for a lot of people is probably the better solution than trying to build something elaborate yourself. Um, that being said, thank you everyone. And I will see you next week.